And so, France reverts to lockdown. Its borders are closed, remote working is reintroduced, but the schools remain open. This is La Vie en France until at least mid-December. Vive la France! Scandal as dozens of COVID-positive patients are transferred into care homes. All Scotland prepares for tears as the pandemic continues its grip. And movement in Nigeria, the country's young, lead calls for change. From Caledonia Media, I'm Charles Fletcher with Scotland's favourite political show, The Week in Hollywood. We need to learn something from it in terms of building something new that's better that recognises the value of good care and looking after the people at the end of their life. The people we love. Yes, absolutely. Matanba Fiskama. At least 78 COVID-positive patients were discharged from hospitals into care homes in the spring. The full number is likely to be more than 100 and potentially more than 400 people. The figures are revealed this week in a report from Public Health Scotland. The First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, says there is no statistical evidence hospital discharges led to coronavirus outbreaks in our care homes. The analysis does not find statistical evidence that hospital discharges of any kind were associated with care home outbreaks. And what they mean by of any kind is uh, discharges where a person tested negative before discharge to a care home or tested positive or were not tested at all. It is important, though, for me to point out that the level of certainty about that conclusion differs in each of these three scenarios. But the overall conclusion is, as I have stated, that there is no statistical evidence that hospital discharges of any kind were associated with care home outbreaks. Um, I understand this is similar uh, to the findings observed by Public Health Wales when it also looked at this issue. Now, as I said a moment ago, uh, this report is important and it's important uh, for accountability, it's also important for learning, but it is of no comfort and it never would be of any comfort to those who lost a loved one. So we will be supporting Public Health Scotland to take forward further work and analysis so that we have as detailed an understanding as possible of the outbreaks that did take place in care homes and of course we will continue our work uh, of the last few months to further improve safety measures in care homes. Shadow Health Secretary Donald Cameron says the report reveals a scandalous dereliction in the provision of public health to some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland. Liberal Democrat leader Willie Rennie is clear. This is not reacting with hindsight. He'd called for widespread testing earlier. He says this borders on recklessness and never again should this happen in our care homes. Well, there's no doubt that allowing people and it looks like there was over a hundred, at least many more potentially, who knowingly were admitted into care homes with the virus, is bound to have added to the problem of the spread of the virus in the care homes. We know that once it gets in, that it spreads quite fast. And we've seen, what, over 2,000 people who have died in our care homes. Now, they say it's not as significant as the, the size of the care home, but it's added to the problem and therefore potentially put even more people at risk. And that's why it's important to recognise what this means and not try to say that it wasn't a significant factor, because there's no doubt that it was. You have described this policy as a dark day. Surely you would think that if you're testing somebody for something like COVID-19, you would at the very least wait until you got a result. And if it was a positive result, perhaps you would isolate them in hospital until they were negative. I mean, some people might say this is easy to say in hindsight, but it wasn't hindsight because we said at the time, I mean, I was astonished back at the start of the pandemic, when I discovered that they weren't testing admissions into care homes to make sure they were free of the virus before they put them in. 
Now, I understood at the time that some people would later test positive, even though they had tested negative at the time. I understood the nature of the virus, but they were knowingly admitting people. And I found that astonishing. But most importantly of all, they refused to do the widespread testing of the residents. They wouldn't even check. And that, I think, was bordering on recklessness at the time. Now, they said that with proper PPE and the hygiene and the distancing and all those measures, the kind of quarantine inside the care home would be what was required in order to keep this under control. And that if they tested people, somehow it would make them relax and not actually comply with the appropriate hygiene guidance. I'm afraid that that just wasn't enough. And we've seen the cost of that in the lives of people in care homes. And I deeply regret that. And I'm sure the First Minister really deeply regrets it as well. What should happen now? I think we've got to learn this lesson about the value of having testing. We've got to make sure that never again are care homes allowed to go without appropriate and adequate PPE. We need to make sure that we've got adequately staffed care homes that they can cope with this going forward. This is going to be a real, I think, moment for social care in this country. We need to learn something from it in terms of building something new that's better, that recognises the value of good care and looking after the people at the end of their life. The people we love. Yes, absolutely. And I think for many people across the country, this will be a really terrifying day. They'll have already suffered from trauma of their loved ones having lost their lives. We've had that. But now to discover, to discover this, that thousands of people went in untested and others went in knowing they were positive, I think it will be a very difficult day for many people. Glasgow Labour MP Anna Sawa tells the Week in Holyrood the Public Health Scotland report is devastating, but sadly, not a surprise. Look, I think this report is breathtaking. I think it's uh, devastating, but sadly not a surprise. Um, We have seen uh, the care home sector bear the brunt of the pandemic so far. Almost 50% of all deaths that we've experienced in Scotland have happened in Scotland's care homes. And that's a tragedy for those individual families. Um, It's a tragedy for people working in the care home sector, but also a wider tragedy for right across Scotland. And I, I, I just continue to be completely shocked by how this was allowed to happen. Um, I I think it's common sense that every single person should have been tested before they were transferred uh, into a care home. I don't think we required science for that. Um, We knew there was asymptomatic uh, transfer long at the start of this uh, pandemic. Uh, But we particularly knew that the most vulnerable people were the ones that live in care homes. They were the most at risk. So why would we not test people? before we transfer them into a care home sector. I, I, just, I just think that's common sense. But the part that I think is criminal is to actually have tested some individuals and for them to have tested positive, and despite them testing positive, sending them into these care homes is completely unforgivable. And as a result, we have had really, really shocking levels of uh, cases in care homes and tragically deaths. And I just don't accept the First Minister's Um, analysis that there is no connection between positive cases being sent into care homes and care homes getting cases and then people losing their lives. I just don't, I'm just not willing to believe that. We proactively threw this virus into care homes with devastating consequences. The First Minister has introduced five new tiers of restrictions in the battle against the pandemic. They'll come into effect on Monday. No local authority in Scotland is in the highest or the lowest tiers but travel restrictions will affect us all. The Highlands, Orkney, Shetland, the Western Isles and Moray are on level one. The Central Belt is on level three, much the same as they are now, and that tier includes North and South Lanarkshire and the city of Dundee. The rest of Scotland is on level two. You can check your area level on the Scottish Government website or your local authority site. You're listening to The Week in Holyrood. I'm Charles Fletcher. More on COVID and the government's strategy later in the programme. Also coming up, generational movement in Nigeria as young people challenge the elite. I'm joined by B.B. McKinley from Jambo Radio in Glasgow. 
While you could see it coming, questions to the First Minister this week focus on the Public Health Scotland report. Welcome to the Chamber of Scotland's National Parliament. Here's the Group Leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, Ruth Davidson. Yesterday the First Minister said, I'm not trying just to pick on specific lines. But she had already selectively picked her line from the report. She quoted... Overall, the analysis does not find statistical evidence that hospital discharges were associated with care home outbreaks. Of course, the First Minister chose not to read the next line. It said there was a relatively wide variation in the estimated levels of risk. So can the First Minister now tell us how high might the true risk have been of putting known COVID-positive patients into care homes? First Minister. President Officer, can I uh, begin by recognising again uh, the toll COVID has taken on people in care homes? Uh, the fact that that is not unique to Scotland does not in any way detract from the distress and the grief that has been caused. And I want to say again today that I am deeply sorry uh, for that. The position on testing uh, changed in line with evidence and advice. That was true in Scotland. It was true in other parts of the UK. Uh, but the absence of testing did not equate to an absence of action. Uh, guidance was in place all along that was designed to minimise the risks in care homes. Uh, but we continue to learn lessons, we continue to apply these lessons and we continue to take uh, with the utmost seriousness the duty on government uh, to do everything possible to protect the general population and particularly those who are most vulnerable. Um, yesterday, and I, uh, you know, it's, it's for other people to judge. I, I don't know that people watching uh, all of uh, the, the hour or more I spent answering questions on this yesterday would have concluded that I tried to hide any aspect of this. This is a difficult situation for families and for the public generally. I quoted the conclusion of the report, uh, but this report has hard messages for us. It tells us some of what uh, we think uh, are factors in driving outbreaks in care homes, but there is work still to do to understand this. And of course, we have the information uh, now uh, that the report gives us because we commissioned this report. Similar things have happened in other countries where we still don't have this level of information. I am determined we continue to learn and apply lessons um, and do everything we can to pe pe keep people in our care homes safe um, and to keep the general public as safe as we possibly can. Ruth Davison. I thank the First Minister for the answer, but it didn't address the specific question that I put to her, which was what was the increased risk. When somebody tested positive for COVID before being transferred to a care home, the report said that the best estimate was a 45% increase in risk of an outbreak. But because of the wide variation I, I quoted, the risk could have been much higher. In fact, the report says it could have been as high as 374%. A 300 and 74% increase in risk of seeing COVID rip through a care home. This is exactly why we need the public inquiry to start now, because there is so much we still don't know. What we do know is that only 13.5% of care homes who were never sent any patients ended up having an outbreak. That jumped to 38% when a home had one or more patients put into their care. But we still don't know how high that number goes when a care home had a known COVID-positive patients sent to them. That's pretty basic stuff. Why was that number left out of the report? First Minister. Uh, this was a report that was done independently of government. Public Health Scotland uh, published the report, but the report was contributed to by uh, academics who are entirely independent. They conducted uh, a briefing with journalists yesterday to explain in, in more detail their methodology and their findings. I don't think this report is the last word on these issues. I, I have never thought that uh, there is much more work to be done to understand uh, the issues that uh, were factors in care home outbreaks. Uh, this report tells us some of that, but it does not tell us all of that. Uh, of course, this report gives us much more information than is available in any other part of the UK, and I hope we will see this uh, depth of understanding develop in countries elsewhere so that we can learn from each other as well as from our own experiences. Um, the uh, overall conclusion of the report is as I quoted yesterday, um, but I, I recognised yesterday that in terms of the different scenarios, whether uh, somebody tested positive, tested ne negative or were not tested at all, while the report said that in all of these scenarios there was not statistical evidence 
that hospital discharges were associated with outbreaks, it did say, and I recognised that, that yesterday, that uh, there was a, a variation in that, the confidence of that across these different scenarios. Uh, but what the report did say, of course, is, and I'm quoting from page 41 of it, uh, is that the risk of an outbreak associated with care home size is much larger than any plausible risk from a hospital uh, discharge. Now, what that says is that while we must continue to consider the issues around discharges, we also have have to look at the other factors, and the Health Secretary will talk more about this week, uh, this next week in Parliament uh, when she sets out uh, winter planning for social care. Um, I take all of these issues extremely seriously. I have given a commitment. Um, again, you know, I have done this uh, before. Many uh, other countries have. There will be a full public inquiry. That full public inquiry will look at the issues of care homes. We are in the grip of a second wave of COVID. I think it is right that we enable everybody who has a part to play to focus on getting the country through that. Um, I was struck uh, by comments this morning from Professor June Andrews, who will be familiar to many people across this chamber, uh, when she was asked about the timing of a public inquiry. And she said, uh, it's far too soon now. We've got far too many things to do to keep the system going, to keep people well. There is no doubt there will be a public inquiry. But at the moment, we will continue uh, we will continue. I, I, just for the avoidance of doubt, uh, Presiding Officer, June Andrews will also have said things critical of the government. I am not trying uh, to uh, depart from that at all. Uh, there will be a full public inquiry when the time for that is right, when we have got the country through uh, this next stage of COVID. But as we go, as we have done all along, we will continue to learn and apply lessons in care homes. Um, and that's a responsibility all of us in government take very seriously. Ruth Davison. I'm not sure the best defence against selective quoting is to selectively quote what Professor June Andrews said on the radio this morning. It was devastating to this government. And the calculation yesterday appears to have been that by publishing yesterday's report, any pressure to speed up or bring forward that public inquiry would ease. And I believe that the opposite is the case and because of the way that yesterday's report was handled. It was delayed by a month. It was given to ministers privately on Monday. It was only released to the media 15 minutes before questions and with a press release issued that didn't even bother to mention known COVID positive patients being sent to care homes in the first place. And the very last people to get this report of all, to get sight of it, were the families and loved ones of those who died. We already know that a crucial line in Public Health Scotland's briefing to journalists, the briefing the First Minister just mentioned, that it was likely that hospital discharges are the source of introduction of infection in a small number of cases, was missing from the final report. Does the First Minister really think that the delay, the spin and the sleight of hand surrounding this report serves those grieving families well? First Minister. I, I don't expect grieving families uh, to be um, assured or to have all of their concerns satisfied by, by any report. And, and I don't think this report is the only uh, or the final word. It was a, a report that was commissioned by the Scottish Government. Um, I, I would say again that we are the only government in the UK so far to commission a report of this depth. Um, and I think that... Wales is the only government that has done anything to look at this issue, but that was a, a report, as I understand it, based on statistical modelling, not on actual data. Uh, so that is important. The, the timing of it was down to Public Health Scotland, and they consulted with the Statistics Authority, given the complexity of bringing the different data sets together. As with all official statistics, the date of publication was pre-announced. Um, and, you know, in terms of the timing of it, I, I answer questions uh, every single day um, at the moment. There is no shortage of opportunities to, to scrutinise me rightly and properly. This report does not change, in my view, uh, the, the arguments one way or another on a public inquiry. As I said yesterday, I expected this report to say something different than what it did um, on hospital discharges. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, a public inquiry is necessary. Um, and until that point, it is also necessary that we continue to deepen our understanding and take the actions that are necessary, just as we did back in April when, in light of changing advice and evidence, we moved to uh, testing of uh, discharges to care homes, just as we later moved to uh, routinely test all workers in care homes. We announced last week plans to extend that into designated visitors and other uh, routine visitors to care homes. We are learning and applying that learning on an ongoing basis. Um, I, there are no words I will ever find to convey the depth of my regret at what happened in care homes. Um, and I take possibly more seriously than I take anything else, including any other aspect, 
uh, of our handling of this pandemic, uh, the need to ensure that we learn lessons where we got things wrong, that we don't shy away from that, but more than anything, we take all possible steps to keep those in our care homes safe. Labour leader Richard Leonard is unimpressed by both the report and the First Minister's reaction to it. Can I thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement uh, today? In it, it's clear that there are some local communities which are at a lower tier than was predicted, but there are some that, that are at a higher tier than was predicted. Has the government worked out what this decision today means for people's jobs and incomes in those areas which are in the higher tiers? What further consultation will there be in these areas between now and Monday? And if these health measures are, in the government's view, proportionate, will the government work to introduce proportionate economic measures to protect jobs, businesses and local public services, especially for those in Tier 3 now and for those that might be in Tier 4 in the future? First Minister. I very much hope, I can't guarantee it, and you heard what I said earlier on, um, but I very much hope that we can avoid any part of the country, let alone the whole country, going into level four, and that, I think, is a responsibility not just for government but for all of us. Um, I said, and I'll repeat, we have deliberately taken a cautious approach right now, firstly because the situation here at home and across the UK and Europe is very fragile and we have to recognise that. But secondly, and I hope people uh, will understand this, we are migrating to a new system. Uh, this differentiated approach is not one that we have applied yet in this way. And I think a degree of caution for the first application of that is merited. So there are uh, some areas, I cited the Borders and Argyll and Butte, who are are in level one, who could and did make a case that they should go straight into level zero, uh, and that is something we will consider as we go forward. Um, and likewise, there are parts of the country, Inverclyde, uh, that made a case that they should go into to level two, but the reasons uh, why that is not the case have been set out. I would encourage members to read the paper that we have published, which goes into more detail about this decision-making. All of this has an impact on jobs, public services and livelihoods, and I am acutely aware of that. But what will have a bigger impact on jobs and services and livelihoods is if we don't control this virus. We only have to look across Europe right now um, at Germany, at France last night, going into full nationwide lockdowns again. Uh, that is what we want to avoid, and this is our best chance of doing that. Uh, we have set out support that will be available for businesses. They will, that will apply to businesses that are either closed or have restricted trading, regardless of what level they are in, and information is available on the website I mentioned earlier on. Uh, the replacement job support scheme comes into place next week as well, uh, run by the UK government. I, and I think Richard Leonard and I are in agreement about this, that should go further, uh, but it is there for businesses to take account of. We are providing as much business support as we can within the resources we have available, and we will continue to work with the UK government to try to extend uh, that further. Uh, but it is right and proper that businesses are supported, but we will do no favours to any businesses if we ease up to an extent prematurely surely that allows the virus to run out of control again, because that is a sure and certain route to level four, not just for parts of the country, but for the whole country. And I think all of us want to avoid that. Richard Leonard. Can I thank the First Minister uh, for that answer? And let me also turn to the serious question of what has happened in our care homes. Yesterday's Public Health Scotland report shows that 123 patients were discharged from hospital after testing positive. Over 300 patients who were discharged had been in hospital for COVID-19, and thousands of elderly patients were transferred into care homes without being tested at all. First Minister, care homes that took discharges were three times more likely to have outbreaks than those which did not. So are you really comfortable telling the families of those who have lost loved ones that there is no link between your government's decision to discharge people into care homes untested and the tragic outbreaks which then occurred. 
Um, I, th th that is not what I'm saying, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a, a second in a moment. Can I just, however, correct an uh, uh, inadvertent error in my last answer to Richard Leonard, where I said that borders in Argyll and Butte were in level one and argued to go to level zero. Of course, borders in Argyll and Butte are in level two and uh, made a case or could have made a case to go to, to level one. My apologies for that uh, mistake. O on care homes, I am I'm not saying, and the report doesn't say there is no link. Uh, the report says that taking account of all of the factors, uh, hospital discharge uh, was not uh, a statistically significant factor compared to, for example, the size of a care home. That does not mean, and this is a point I laboured to make yesterday and will always make, there were serious outbreaks in care homes. Uh, discharges did not have no effect on that, um, but there are other factors that we have to consider as well. And at the end of the day, the fact that there was big outbreaks that led to people losing their lives is something that I will never be comfortable with, uh, not just as First Minister, but I will never be comfortable with for uh, probably the rest of, of my life. I want to understand this and I want to make sure that we continue to take the action that is uh, necessary to protect older people in care homes. Our position on testing changed, as I said, in line with advice and evidence, um, and rightly so. But a key point here, which remains important now, even when we have a much uh, wider approach to testing in care homes, is that the absence of testing, even the presence of testing, should not allow us to ignore the other important things that have to be done. Ahead in the programme, we have extended coverage of the COVID debate at Holyrood. First, unfolding events in Nigeria. And a popular movement, principally led by young people, is tackling the elite but peaceful protest has been met by a brutal response. I spoke with lawyer Benny Briggs McKinley, who says people have had enough of mistreatment. With the youth in the forefront of the, rev I'll say, quote-unquote revolution, it's quite enlightening because the youth, we see that the youth are coming up, coming to their own and refusing the status quo. So a horrible thing happened last week, last Tuesday, and I think it's etched in our history now, the 20th of October 2020, there was a peaceful protest going on to end SARS. And as you know, you probably know, your listeners know, SARS is a special anti-robbery squad, which was set up for, to, you know, fight crime in the country, in that country and protect the citizens against crime. And then they start, they got, you know, they started, their powers grew beyond their remit or rather they um, stretched themselves beyond their remit and they started harassing citizenry and um, killing the extra extrajudicial killings, arrests and all kinds of horrible occurrences. And it seemed like everybody had a SARS story, especially the young people, the, 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 the middle aged people, the older people, you know, they didn't really, they don't really have SARS stories, so to speak. They don't really have a lot to share. But the younger people, people in their 20s and their 30s, who, you know, people who are doing well, they want to know why you're doing well. And people who are not doing well or are going about um, you know, their businesses, they're harassed. They were harassed. And so things came to a head when a couple of weeks ago, somebody, a, young, a young man was killed just arbitrarily. He was killed arbitrarily by, and was filmed. And the film went viral and people had had enough. Enough. There was a time when all we talked of was Brexit. That's still important and still topical, but today we shift our reportage to COVID. This week, MSPs debated what to do and how to tackle the virus. Here's our extended coverage of that debate, beginning with First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. The rising cases we are seeing in Scotland is part of an international pattern that's reflected elsewhere in the UK, Europe and across the world. Indeed, many countries across Europe in particular face a much more severe situation than we do currently. However, it is to try to avoid that kind of deterioration and to uh, try to avoid mounting pressure on our National Health Service that we are acting firmly at this stage. It's why we acted back in September to stop household gatherings and then took further action earlier this month to restrict hospitality. The positive news is that we believe the restriction on household gatherings may already be having an effect. The number of new cases is growing more slowly than at the start of the month and we have not seen the nine-day doubling of cases that was predicted earlier this month. We hope that the effect of the difficult and, I know, unwelcome restrictions on hospitality, which have been enforced now for just over two weeks, will soon start to be seen as well. 
Our hope is that the rate of increase in new cases will slow even further and that we will then see a decline in the number of new cases. And if we do see that progress, it is important to stress that that will be down to a reduction in our interactions with each other as a result of the restrictions in place. Willie Rennie, I'm keen to understand where we are on asymptomatic testing now. Does the government now accept that self-isolation of the 80% who have the virus but are not showing symptoms is a benefit that outweighs any of the disadvantages? First Minister. Um, we think it is important and uh, valuable to extend asymptomatic testing. Uh, we have done that already. The clinical advice, um, and this was published in a paper uh, last week from our advisors, is that the priority for that should be to protect the most vulnerable. And I'll come on to this a bit more uh, detail later on. Uh, the priority in terms of the, the first uh, priority for testing is people with symptoms, uh, but we will uh, not just extend asymptomatic testing for those uh, who can help us protect the vulnerable groups, but as we have set out, we will extend that further as capacity allows uh, as part of our increased surveillance um, and in managing outbreaks. So I agree with Willie Rennie in principle that it is important, but we have to balance the capacity we have with the clinical priorities that have been set. Um, as I was saying, uh, the virus we know does direct harm to human life and health, and we must minimise that. Uh, but we also know that the actions uh, that we take to do this cause harm as well to the economy and living standards and to wider health and wellbeing. Uh, so the difficult task all countries have is to balance all of that and minimise the overall harm of the pandemic. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Just on that uh, point, I wonder if the First Minister would advise Parliament whether or not scrutiny will be given of the new framework um, in terms of an opportunity to scrutinise the connected regulations before they're actually implemented? First Minister. Uh, yes, Graeme Day will be having, and uh, I, I hope these discussions will be fruitful, uh, with other uh, opposition parties exactly how that will be done. We would suggest perhaps there is a, a dual uh, approach to this where uh, relatively minor changes to the regulations uh, go through the committee process, but more uh, substantial changes would involve some plenary input uh, from the Parliament. Uh, we are open-minded to that. It is important to, to recognise that the levels will be implemented by effectively template regulations, which the COVID committee will be able to uh, scrutinise in the normal way. But any changes to areas going in or out of levels will also trigger changes to the regulations, which the COVID committee will be able to scrutinise. And if there are more substantial changes, um, I suspect there will be a desire for the Parliament as a whole to be involved in that. So we will continue uh, to try to seek... Uh, yeah, I'll take one more intervention at the moment before I try to make some progress. Neil Findlay. Thanks very much. And I... Uh, these are extremely uh, difficult times for everybody, and I'm sure uh, for, for no one more than the First Minister. But um, scrutiny is absolutely essential. We have been given a number of documents at 12 o'clock today to try and work our way through. This is very complex stuff. We have had no opportunity to consult with businesses in our area, local authorities in our area, and constituents who are writing to us in their droves on a number of issues. So can I plead, make a plea to the First Minister? During the Brexit legislation, we were able to do things in this Parliament quickly that allowed proper scrutiny of emergency legislation. We cannot go on as, as we are at the moment with having things imposed without scrutiny. It is absolutely essential. It is absolutely essential we do that. And I will plead to the First Minister to open this up to far more scrutiny than we have had to date. First Minister. Um, in, in principle, I, I actually agree uh, with, with Neil Finlay and uh, with the previous comment. Um, the, the one caveat I would inject here, which I, I have before, is that unlike Brexit, we're, we're dealing with an infectious virus. There is a, a real importance for the government to be able to act quickly where that is necessary and merited, and I think people would accept that. But I absolutely agree, the further we go into this, we need to uh, balance that with the legitimate demand for Parliament, not just to be consulted and have the ability to scrutinise, but to do that early and before <coughs> changes are made, wherever that is possible. And I give a commitment today to try to facilitate that as much as possible. Under all five levels, uh, we uh, want schools and childcare to remain open, if at all possible. 
Uh, since publishing the proposed levels on Friday, we've consulted with various stakeholders, and I've said, as I've said, those con consultations included uh, discussions with opposition leaders. Um, and finally, Presiding Officer, uh, we know that while government has the responsibility to lead, success against this virus will depend on all of us. It is difficult and frustrating, and getting uh, more so by the day, especially as we head towards Christmas. But if we dig in now and get COVID under more control, we perhaps open the door not to 100% normality by Christmas, but hopefully to more than we have right now. Uh, we all want to see that. Uh, so please, I'm asking people to stick with it. As of Monday, make sure you check what restrictions apply in your area. Uh, please stay out of other people's houses, except for the limited reasons allowed. Follow the rules on face coverings, avoiding crowded places, cleaning hands, two metres distancing and self-isolating and getting a test if you have symptoms. And all of us must try to be as patient as possible at not being able to go to the football or for a pint or out for a meal with friends. These are hard sacrifices, but they will protect you and your loved ones. They will help protect the NHS and they will save lives. And right now, presiding officer, that is what we must all pull together to seek to do. Thank you very much. And I call on Ruth Davison to be followed by Richard Leonard. Ruth Davison. So let's start with where we are in full agreement and alignment with the Scottish Government. First, in the need to recognise the importance of local authorities and health boards in this process, to make sure that the people delivering on the ground have the earliest possible input to, on what they're being asked to enact. Also, on keeping the schools open as a priority, the First Minister will know that the Conservatives have been unwavering in our recognition of the importance of the physical opening and attendance at school. Where plans for blended learning were being advanced for half days and part weeks, we were clear that our young people had been damaged enough through this pandemic and that keeping the learning, the social contact and the structure of school was an imperative and the framework recognises this. In changes from our proposals last week, she confirms that informal childcare allowed at tiers 0 and 1 will now be extended to include tiers 2 and 3 and that change is welcome and so too is the announcement today of a postcode checker to allow people to check what restrictions apply to them. Where we are disappointed is the late change to today's motion to take a swipe at the UK Government, making no recognition of the £7.2 billion of additional funding for Scotland during the pandemic, including £700 million worth of support announced at the start of, of October. Businesses need clarity on the tier system that we're moving to, and they need clear communication and advance warning. And so too do our councils. Now, I understand that council leaders spoke to the Deputy First Minister yesterday and they were advised that there would be movement within tiers or sub-tiers. So an area could be level one, but with some level two restrictions, which would uh, 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 effectively make it level one plus. And the obvious consequence of that would be that there'd be more gradations and combinations of restrictions than the five that have been previously set out. So key to retaining the public's trust and compliance is uh, uh, absolutely uh, seeking clarity on this point. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. I'm grateful to Ruth Davison for taking the intervention. Can I say to her that um, whatever has been conveyed to her is not the position. We have been very clear, subject to the modifications that the First Minister has made today, that the basis of the levels as set out will be what we um, commence our, our, our arrangements to include. Uh, there may be stages at which we can apply uh, different constraints within different local authorities but not at the starting point. And that's the point the First Minister made about, for example, the Argyle Islands compared to the mainland of Argyle. That clarity is hugely welcome, but it demonstrates some of the difficulties that we've already seen in this process before these tiers are brought in. You're listening to The Week in Hollywood. I'm Charles Fletcher. And I call Richard Leonard to be followed by Alison Johnson. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Government has been trying to build cross-party consensus for this framework over this past week. And to those of us who have had friends, neighbours, family members struck down by this virus, who have been hospitalised, who will suffer the long-term effects, or others still who did not make it, we know just how serious this is. We do not need to be reminded. And so that we agree that we should strive for a consensus. But our first duty is collectively to get this right. We need to get this right for Scotland because people are suffering, businesses are suffering, and communities are suffering. Scotland has already paid a price, which is why it remains our firm view that members of this parliament 
need to be able to ask questions of government ministers in this parliament about this framework in advance of us voting on it. A week ago, this was the agreed position. Then, days ago, this was withdrawn in what was clearly a political decision, which begs the question for many people, what has the government got to hide? A simple parliamentary debate on this motion is not sufficient. It does not give us the level of parliamentary scrutiny which the people who send us here rightly expect. Private briefings with opposition party leaders have their place, but they cannot be a substitute for public and parliamentary debate, scrutiny and interrogation. That is our view. Of course. I, First Minister. Um, I appreciate the point Richard Leonard is making. I, I don't think I can be fairly... Um, criticised for shying away from questions. Uh, I've given up teen, umpteen statements in the Parliament, answered probably hundreds of questions in the Parliament. I'll be back here on Thursday for the weekly FMQs. The view was this was the time to have a, a lengthy parliamentary debate uh, with a vote at the end, which we don't have a vote at the end of a statement. But I will come to Parliament as often um, as necessary, as often as is wanted. I will stay here for as long as possible to, to answer questions. I've made that very clear. I probably, um, I'll, I'll no doubt be corrected if I'm wrong on this, but I'll probably answer more questions than any leader of any government anywhere uh, else in the world and I'm happy to continue to do that because that is my responsibility. Richard Leonard. We have always said that the gloom of this pandemic must be illuminated by the light of scientific reason and that means evidence, credible evidence, persuasive evidence, reliable evidence, evidence that people can see and understand. So we need much greater transparency over the indicators that are being used to determine which tier a local population is being placed in. Yes, I'll take an intervention. First Minister. The paper today, the, the, the data that will be used and the thresholds and how that decision-making process will work, but I uh, had already had an intervention with Ruth Davidson, but can I remind people that most of the data and evidence we have is already published on the Public Health Scotland website. Anybody can go in and look at the data on a daily basis in their own neighbourhood. Some of the evidence that is asked for, I, I said this to Richard Leonard when we met last week, I understand the call for that, but some of the additional evidence that has been asked for is evidence that in Scotland or any other country simply does not yet exist. So we will publish and already do publish uh, most of the data that is available to us and we'll continue to do that as, at as granular a level as it's possible to do. You're listening to The Week in Holyrood from the Scottish Parliament. I'm Charles Fletcher. Thank you very much and I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Willie Rennie. Alison Johnson. It is vital that the Scottish Government's strategy to tackle COVID-19 is properly scrutinised by Parliament and that we have the opportunity to work towards political consensus. As our amendment states, the Greens believe that the ultimate goal should be elimination of the virus. The Scottish Government's framework states that the strategic intent is to suppress the virus to its lowest possible level and to keep it there, while we strive to return to a more normal life for as many people as possible. People worked hard to suppress the virus over the summer, but it has subsequently escalated out of control. We have to learn, we need to understand why, and we need to have the opportunity to scrutinise and debate the government's response on an ongoing basis, because we can't continue to lurch from one lockdown to the other until an, an, until an effective vaccine becomes available. Uh, yes? Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. And I note what Alison Johnson said, in which case I was wondering if she might be able to tell me why the Green Party didn't support a, question, uh, a statement with questions today and then a debate with the vote tomorrow for better scrutiny this week of this whole framework and what has gone before in the 16 days? Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very I'm comfortable with the Green Party's scrutiny of the pandemic. As my amendment states, routine asymptomatic testing will be an important tool in an elimination strategy. We know that those carrying COVID-19 can be asymptomatic while contagious, and we can't continue to wait for people to show symptoms before we test them. Now, the framework refers to an expansion of asymptomatic testing to certain groups, but we need to go further and faster. In universities, for example, the framework limits ambition for asymptomatic testing so that it will only be used in response to an outbreak. But by this time, the damage has been done. 
Universities in England are increasingly developing their own testing capacity using innovative techniques to routinely test as many staff and students as they can. The University of Cambridge, for example, can now test up to 16,000 people per week as part of their own screening programme. So I call on the Scottish Government to work with Scottish universities to let this happen here as soon as possible. Because don't forget, it was the return of universities in September that helped propel us into the second wave, causing misery for thousands of students confined to overcrowded halls. We can't let this happen again. Let's learn... Um, yes? Neil Findlay. Just gave that the university can test 16,000 people a week. We in, this, in Scotland are still not testing home care workers every week. That is absolutely appalling. NHS staff who are on the front line are still not being tested every week. That's the reality of it. And that's why we require far more scrutiny than we've got at the moment. Alison Johnson. I agree wholeheartedly with Mr Finlay. I presented the government with a paper in April calling for asymptomatic testing and outlining the research of Imperial College who showed that such testing could help reduce transmission of the virus by up to a third. And the fact that this paper today speaks of the introduction of the testing of community nurses really is quite frankly shocking. I think a lot of people will be very surprised to learn that that isn't happening as a matter of course. You're listening to The Week in Holyrood from the Scottish Parliament. I'm Charles Fletcher. Thank you very much. And I call Willie Rennie. Uh, we have worked uh, constructively through the pandemic and will continue to do so. Uh, the good news is that the government now seems to accept the much wider use of asymptomatic testing. The 80% of those with the virus but with no symptoms, can now self-isolate with a positive test. That's a major change. That benefit outweighs, I believe, any negative behaviours that may come with a negative test. If we had accepted this principle earlier, we might have been in the position today to snuff out any outbreaks before they spread in our communities. And then we might have been able to avoid the imposition of generic crude restrictions that we're talking about today. The First Minister, I know, disagrees with this, but the government was getting carried away over the summer with talk of elimination, and they missed the opportunity to get ready for the widely predicted second wave, with greater testing, improving the tracing capacity, but also the quarantine spot check capacity. Yes, certainly. The, the, the government wasn't carried away. What was said about what was achieved by the Scottish public as, as we reached the summer was entirely accurate and that we didn't waste time. Mr Rennie knows that the, way, the reason why we are able now to look at wider cohorts of asymptomatic testing is because we have built up the NHS Scotland capacity to take testing, and that will allow us, along with what the UK government can manage in terms of the Lighthouse Lab, to have that headroom in capacity as we enter winter to introduce more cohorts on in asymptomatic testing. So it is entirely wrong, notwithstanding that we continue to have that disagreement that we do have, to say that we were either complacent or foolish in what we said and did over the summer months. I can I ask the interventions be kept a bit shorter, please? Will you, any? I'm sorry to disagree with the Health Secretary. I don't think she was foolish. I don't think that. What I do think is they had an ideological objection to having asymptomatic testing because they believed the negative behaviours that would come from that asymptomatic testing would not be of benefit. They have now evolved that position and changed that position and now accept asymptomatic testing on a wider basis. And I think that's a good thing, but I just wish it had been done earlier because we might have been in a better position today. We might have been having that testing to be able to snuff out the virus in our communities. So it was an objection rather than the ability to build up the capacity. And there has been much chopping and changing in recent weeks. So we need some stability on the restrictions. I do want to see greater involvement of the Parliament in approving the big changes to the levels. I support the various committees of the Parliament approving the regulations in advance of any change. I also support the Chamber 
debating any substantial changes. You're listening to The Week in Holyrood with debate from the Chamber at the Scottish Parliament. I'm Charles Fletcher. Thank you very much, and I call on Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Let me start by talking about the simplicity of the message, because we know that simplicity is important in ensuring compliance. And I am genuinely worried that the framework is complex. We've gone from a four-phase strategic route map to five tiers of a framework, um, but numbered zero to four, a complex basket of indicators to determine which tier your local area is in, a lack of clarity about the length of time that this might apply for um, and what flexibilities might apply in exercising judgment. I do get, though, that being more targeted does increase complexity, so there is a fine balance to be struck. But I am concerned that compliance is reducing. That has to worry us. A recent survey told us that only 27% of people fully understand the guidance. Not very many could tell you what facts stand for, despite the First Minister's Herculean efforts. The UK government um, is in this case, I think, marginally better. Even I can remember hands, face and space. But we all agree that for the, the public to be able to follow these messages and to keep themselves and others safe, we need clarity on what they are being asked to do. So I welcome the postcode checker, but I do think we need to go further. Common sense, consistency and clarity is essential to take people with us. Richard Lend was right to acknowledge the frustration that people feel, whether it's individuals separated from families or unable to see loved ones in care homes or indeed businesses who are in danger of making staff redundant or closing for good. But I do genuinely believe that if we treat people like adults, they will respond in kind. I'm happy to give way to Graham Day. Graham Day. The member for uh, giving way. Um, she talks about the need for clarity. I wonder if Jackie Bailey um, could clarify on behalf of uh, Labour where they actually stand on the government motion seeking Parliament to note rather than endorse the plan. Because earlier in the debate, Elaine Smith criticised the noting approach. Yet, um, in the lead-up to this debate, it was actually Scottish Labour who asked the government to take this approach. President Officer, I'm quite confused. I wonder if Jackie Bailey could uh, end my confusion. Jackie Bailey. Can, I, I, think, I think what was interesting was, you know, people were criticised earlier on for talking about process rather than substance. I think Graham Day is trying to take us back there. But my understanding is, is that this was a discussion between special advisers and not politicians. So at the end of the day, what matters is what is said in this chamber. Can I also make a plea for geographical guidance? In constituencies like mine, which straddle two local authority areas, people are used to working and socialising across local boundaries. One area is tier two as I read it. The other is likely to be tier three. Understanding what you can do um, to allow you to plan your life accordingly, I think is going to be quite important. There were real problems with travel restrictions previously, um, and that coupled with the closure of car parks and toilets with the national, in the National Park, um, Forestry Scotland, Land Scotland and councils cause chaos. So I'd ask the First Minister, can we avoid that kind of chaos again? Thank you. First Minister. This, this is a genuine question and I'm genuinely interested in the answer. Is Jackie Bailey arguing that we shouldn't give advice on travel restrictions or is she arguing that that advice should be placed in law and it should become much more enforceable? When Richard Leonard and I spoke about it a few weeks ago, uh, I think the view, this is not a criticism, was you know, travel restrictions were not a good thing. So wh which way does Labour want us to go? It's a genuine question. I'm genuinely interested in the answer. And, and it's one that I would happily reflect on with local businesses in my constituency because what we saw, um, what we saw was the train suddenly being mobbed coming from Glasgow to Helensburgh, um, the hospitality industry being overwhelmed. Thank you very much. I now call on Jean Freeman to wind up the debate. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And let me start by expressing my gratitude to members across the Chamber for the contributions this afternoon as we shape Scotland's strategic response to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic through the next phases. People who are now enduring long covid um, that we know about and we read more about every day. They will testify to the impact of surviving COVID but enduring long COVID. The rising cases we've seen in recent times in Scotland uh, are cause for considerable concern. But we are seeing 
uh, signs of improvement. And we intend that the steps that we introduced in September have prevented the scale of acceleration that we've seen elsewhere in Europe. The difficulty for all of us, presiding officer, is not the data that we publish, it's being able to triangulate and understand and apply that data and recognise that in dealing with this virus, political judgment on top of good clinical and scientific advice in a context of a virus that the world is learning about and therefore our understanding and knowledge changes constantly means that we don't have the opportunity of binary choices where we might all quite like binary choices. They simply are not there for us. Presiding officer, we do face a serious situation, but it is a less severe situation than many other countries, not only in the United Kingdom, but also across Europe. That is partly because collectively, we did suppress the virus to a very low level over the summer, and because of the effectiveness of test and protect and our health staff in particular. I'm not in the least complacent about that, but our situation right now would be worse if we had not done that. There has been a lot of talk today about hope. Presiding officer, I firmly believe in the importance of hope. I actually believe in the power of hope. I think we can draw hope from what we have achieved so far, from the lessons we've learned and applied in the last nine months, from the dedication of our NHS and social care staff, from the expertise of clinicians and scientists here and globally, and from the efforts of people across the country. This virus, this pandemic, challenges us every day. But working together, not without debate, not without disagreement, certainly not without argument, but working together, we can get through this. Every single one of us in this chamber has to be an advocate for a strategy and approach that puts lives first, recognises what we need to do to mitigate against other harms, but works collectively and with strength.